Hello everyone, this is Dre Dre. If you are new to my channel, welcome! I play spooky games while I tell you a true crime story. Today I am showing my gameplay of the game Alice Madness Returns while I tell you a story about a brutal murder and a case of cannibalism. This is the story of Catherine Knight and her victim. Listener discretion is advised. Her mom always told Kathy to be submissive and go along with whatever men wanted. According to Kathy, this was the best advice her mom ever gave her. Kathy was tough, especially in the slaughterhouse. Some men couldn't handle it, but Kathy loved her knives. Her knives were precious to her. Her knives would glide through the meat with ease. She was like an artist with her canvas. She had a smart mouth, but people feared her knives more. She always threatened to settle every score with her knives. No one was ever brave enough to take her up on this offer, or according to Kathy, no one had balls big enough. If she could, she would take her knives with her everywhere, but she didn't need her knives. She even hung her knives above her bed every night. She would settle scores with women, but usually men at the bars when they had something to say about her and her man. Kathy's dad always taught her to be free with her fists. Her mom always taught her to be free with her body. She would swing at anyone at any time. David was the first man she felt she could trust. Every night, they would stagger home together. Kathy was taught she had to let her man do whatever he wanted to her, and she had to pretend to like it. But her now husband couldn't turn her down either, or could he? After they consummated their marriage, Kathy heard him start to snore. That bastard fell asleep. It was their wedding night. How could he? She started to punch him to wake him up. She wrapped her calloused hands around his throat and started to crush his windpipe. He finally started to wake up. She was full of rage. She said she would teach him a lesson he would never forget. Barbara, Kathy's mom, was married as a teenager to a man named Jack Roland. Barbara and Jack had four boys. Growing up, you were either destined to do farm work, mining, or work in the slaughterhouse. All the local farms had animals that needed to be killed to be shipped out. There was so much workload, they always needed staff. Ken Knight was an asset to the slaughterhouses. He would travel from town to town for work. He had a reputation for being a tough man and a heavy drinker. He was meticulous in his work, working through carcass after carcass. He would complete his work in about half the time it took other men. Jack Rowland was one of these co-workers. They ended up hanging out together to go binge drinking. They shared mutual friends. One of these nights of drinking is where Ken met Barbara. There was chemistry between Ken and Barbara. They would flirt with each other directly in front of Barbara's husband, who was blinded by beer. Barbara learned to hate Jack. She felt trapped in this marriage with a man who didn't care about her. She saw an opportunity with Ken, although she never thought about divorce. Since she was conservative, she knew divorce would be unheard of. She could not imagine. However, she noticed that affairs were much more common. One night, Ken finally realized her interest. When Jack would be carried home by his friends, Barbara hung around. Barbara was whisked away by Ken to his apartment. The next night out, they ignored each other completely. They wanted to make sure there weren't any suspicions. Ken went back to flirting with the bartenders. Jack had his arm around Barbara. It seemed this worked out for Barbara and Ken. Everyone would seem to think she was happy with Jack, even though this was far from the truth. She felt the relationship with Jack was only to keep a roof over her head. Jack started making more busy work for Barbara at home. He wanted her to be an obedient wife at home and in the bedroom. He didn't love her. He didn't help with the children. One night, Jack would beat up Barbara and throw her out in the middle of the street. Most couples would keep their arguments behind closed doors, but not Jack. Within one day, the whole town heard Barbara was now homeless due to her infidelity. The only person who felt she could turn to was Ken. She immediately moved in with Ken. They were now the talk of the town. Jack sent their youngest boys to live with his sister 200 miles away without telling Barbara. The oldest boys would literally spit at Barbara if they saw her in the street and they would yell at her. Barbara and Ken left across South Wales to find a new home. They ended up in the town of Moree. He found work at the slaughterhouse. In this new town, no one knew of how their relationship came about. Barbara was able to successfully divorce Jack through mail. Only a week later, she was branded as Ken Knight's property. They were married rapidly. She was already pregnant and showing. In a few years, they had two sons. She seemed to be stuck in the same crappy routine that she was previously in with Jack. The only difference is now it came with dealing with her alcoholic husband, Ken. He would get drunk daily. 
he would drink away all the money he would earn at work. They wouldn't even have the chance to buy essentials before it would be all gone. She thought she might need to make an escape once again. Ken had a reputation in town. She would need to stay in this relationship and deal with it. She used to love his passion, but now he would demand sexual relations sometimes 10 times per day. And if she was unwilling, he would beat her and force himself on her. Gosh, how awful. She was trapped in the house where she would be beaten and raped. She couldn't leave and risk losing her two children. Her boys were learning from their father. When they started to walk, they would already fist fight with each other and even hit their mother, Barbara. They respected their father, but Barbara was only seen as their servant. Barbara found she was pregnant again. She was carrying twins. She was not happy about this. Now she felt there would be five men against her in the house, more men to torment her and throw demands at her. But to her surprise, she gave birth to two girls. She felt she had allies. Catherine and Joy were born. Joy became a tomboy and was an ally with the other boys in the house. The younger twin, Catherine, turned out to be her mom's only ally. But Ken didn't like how feminine Kathy was. He liked the hyper-masculinity in the house. Ken demanded obedience from his wife and children. The children would not listen to their mother since Ken would beat her down verbally and literally physically. She didn't seem to have any authority around the house. Kathy was beaten with a dog leash when she was disobedient. The other children were beaten too, but Kathy learned to adapt. She learned to comply with what Ken expected. Barbara no longer had an ally. Both of her daughters turned against her in their own way. Barbara became disassociated. Kathy went from playing house with dolls to doing everything around the house. She started to replace her mom in the kitchen and also with Ken. She would take the affection from Ken instead of Barbara. Barbara started to talk to Kathy as her only friend. However, Barbara would go into explicit detail of even the sexual abuse she would endure from Ken. They were both isolated, so Kathy was not aware this was abnormal. Barbara talked to girls that society would push them away due to their ancestry. Kathy was only four years old, Jack passed away, and Barbara and Jack's oldest son came to live with them. Her boys had no respect for their own mother. No one cared about Barbara. They continued to learn from Ken that all women were meant to be their own toys to use. The boys started to look at Kathy. She became a victim of sexual assault in her own house between the ages of four and 14, and each time it became increasingly worse. When her other brothers got older, they joined the other two in their game of rape on Kathy. Kathy did not know this was abnormal since her mother would share her own stories of sexual exploitation. She would share all the disgusting details that men would want to do with women's bodies. During one of Barbara's rants, Kathy finally asked her mom, what do you do if you don't want to do those things? Her mom responded, just let them do what they want with you. It's easier like that. This is the absolute worst advice any mother can give to their daughters. Kathy never spoke about her brothers. She didn't know it was wrong. Kathy started to spend time with her uncle on his farm. She was helping with horses and other animals. She would help nurse animals that required care. This was a nice escape from her daily reality. However, sadly, her uncle took his own life to end his own battle with depression. This was the straw that broke the camel's back for Kathy. She would then stand up for herself after this. The next time one of her brothers tried anything, she punched him and almost broke his jaw and threatened to castrate him if he did anything ever again. Following this, the other brothers started to have mysterious injuries, from black eyes to stab wounds. They would blame their injuries on accident. None of them wanted to speak up about who injured them because if they said it was Kathy, then they would need to admit to what pushed her to this point in the first place. The older boys knew that rape was wrong, and they knew how harsh punishment can be if this got out. After they returned to Aberdeen, Kathy was the new kid at school. She was much tougher than the farm boys that chose to pick on her. The bullying against her did not last very long. Bullies were concerned for their own safety. Once someone crossed Kathy, she would teach them not to with her fists, boots, or her words. One girl tried to trip Kathy once, and Kathy cut off the girl's ponytail with scissors. When any comments were made about her on the school bus, she would smash their faces into the back of the seats. When the teachers would approach her and ask her about her behavior, she would turn on her charm. She would respond politely and respectfully, 
The teachers couldn't get the stories to match up. She made a reputation for herself. She was not one to mess with. At 15, she had basic writing and reading skills, but she was at the top of her class. She was a model student. However, Kathy would end up taking things too far. She started to pick on kids younger than her. She wasn't just defending herself anymore. She stabbed one of the students when they talked back to her. The teachers never found the knife. When they sent a letter home telling her parents of the stabbing, Ken simply asked her if the kid deserved it. She responded yes, and that was the end of that conversation. He seemed proud of his daughter for standing up for herself. All other women were simply property, but his daughter was different because she was his property. Ken wanted her to be able to defend herself. One day, Kathy threw papers at her teacher. She felt her teacher betrayed her. He gave her a bad grade. She jumped out of her seat towards the teacher. She snarled at him. He told her to calm down. She yelled at him. I thought you were on my side. Her teacher continued to back away. She yelled profanities at him. He never expected to hear those words come out of Kathy. Then he noticed she had a knife in her hand. He dodged away from her. He jumped around the classroom running away from her. She continued to slash at him. She had true fury in her eyes. The teacher realized she was not going to stop. He decided he needed to defend himself. He swung at her and hit her in the chin. She landed on her back. She then started to cry loudly. The teacher apologized. She was a 15-year-old girl after all. The teacher and Kathy were suspended from school. The teacher was under investigation. He was reinstated with back pain and she was allowed back to school on probation. Kathy ended up leaving school for good after this. She was later diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. This is the same diagnosis Jodi Arias received from psychologists. If you haven't listened to my Jodi Arias video, check it out. I'll link it at the end of this video. Borderline personality disorder is a mental health disorder that impacts the way you think and feel about yourself and others, causing problems functioning in everyday life. It also includes self-image issues, difficulty managing emotions and behavior, and a pattern of unstable relationships. With borderline personality disorder, you have an intense fear of abandonment or instability. You may have difficulty tolerating being alone. Impulsive behavior is usually self-destructive. When Kathy was enraged, she would see everyone as her enemy. She more likely inherited this trait from her mother. Kathy had such a division between her personalities. Catherine was polite and charming on one side, but then it was replaced with anger, foul mouth monster. She felt everyone was out to get her. After her diagnosis, the medication never really seemed to work on her. It wouldn't inhibit her violent outbursts. She would defend herself. She would deny ever committing the crime, deny her responsibility, then say that her victim deserved the punishment she had given them. If those excuses didn't work, Kathy would always hold on to the diagnosis as an excuse for her actions. It was always her out. It was just her sickness. She would go to the slaughterhouse with her father to beg for a job. She always wanted to work the meat line like her father. She always enjoyed watching him work with his knives. The boss said that job wasn't meant for women. She ended up finding a job at a clothing factory. It was her job to cut the fabric. She would make a lot of her own clothes and she would mend her brother's and father's clothing as well. She was able to eventually move out on her own with the money she was earning. She liked that she could come and go as she pleased. After work, she would go across town to drink with the slaughterhouse workers at the bars. She became well known for settling problems with her fist. The man who would have been her boss at the slaughterhouse would eventually change his opinion about her being too ladylike for the position. She became well known for her foul mouth and her fists. She could hold her own against a man. The age of 16, only one year later, she went back to the slaughterhouse to ask for a job. Since she made a name for herself already, they gave her her dream job. Kathy always knew that she would excel at the slaughterhouse. She was quite skilled with her tools. She would go from production line to production line to harder and harder tasks at which she would excel. She got to meet almost all the men who worked there. However, when someone would make a remark to her, she would say they could settle it with their fucking knives. No one ever took her up on the offer. They could see her work. She finally got put on the most complex job, the deboning. This was the job that built her father's reputation. She was even put to work alongside him every now and then. 
Efficiency went up in the slaughterhouse. No man wanted to be shown up by a teenage girl. They didn't want to be shamed. The owners of the slaughterhouse wanted to reward Kathy somehow. They gifted her with a set of personalized knives and a leather bag. She carried them with her every day. She would then display them above her bed when she got home from work daily. They were her trophies. She loved being at the slaughterhouse. She would even visit on her day off. Kathy was fascinated with all aspects of it. Kathy wanted to participate every step of the slaughterhouse. She made it into a game. She would terrorize some of the animals. These were part of her lunch break activities. Kathy was now 17 years old. She would go straight from work to the bar. She wouldn't drink though. She would only pretend to drink. She would constantly flirt with a man named John Price. However, John argued with Kathy one time and she drew a knife on him. There were other men around who never saw that side of her. In Aberdeen, there were only two places to drink, either the bar or the hotel. The management would normally choose the hotel. Kathy preferred the bar. If she was banned from the bar due to brutal violence, then she would be forced to go to the hotel. Kathy was banned from the bar one night for punching a man who insulted a fellow co-worker named David Kellett. Kathy and David were forced to go to the hotel the next night to drink. David liked that she had defended him. He liked Kathy. Not only did she start to make him home cook meals, she would mend his clothes and she was able to fulfill all of his needs. David was overwhelmed. He didn't know that she had a soft side. They ended up moving in together. They were living and working together. David would get jealous when Kathy would flirt with other co-workers. He started to be pressured to marry Kathy. Kathy didn't want to be abandoned. She wanted David to marry her. She started to hint and then demand he would marry her. He was happy to marry her though. He thought she was one of a kind. They went out to meet her parents and Ken started to begin to retire. Ken was now part-time at the slaughterhouse. Ken was treating Barbara a little bit better, but maybe that was due to lack of energy. Ken and Barbara met David. Ken knew of David from work, but since Barbara had a hard life and no social skills, Barbara approached David and said, oh, so you want to marry Kathy? And Barbara told David that Kathy had a screw loose. David said he knew of Kathy's temper. She told him, you better watch it or she will kill you. David laughed this off. He thought it was funny his future mother-in-law was warning him. David didn't feel Kathy was dangerous. She was perfect. Kathy expected David to love her like her dad loved her mom, with violence and passion. The night before they got married, David told her this was one last night of freedom. She didn't like this. She wasn't a time sentence or a punishment. David started drinking heavily at the bar that day. They went on their way to the ceremony. They signed the license and headed back home. David wanted to celebrate by drinking. Throughout the day, Kathy could hear rumors and snickers about her. She would just glare with a weak look in her eye. She felt that piece of shit people didn't like her. It didn't matter. It was her day. At their wedding and during their dance, he accidentally stepped on her toes and she stomped on his feet right back. At the end of the night, she shoved David into the bedroom. After consummating their marriage, he passed out immediately. When he started snoring, she became so angry. Everything she bottled up from the entire day came pouring out. That piece of shit fell asleep, she thought. She started to beat him, punching him and slapping him. He was so drunk he would hardly recognize the abuse. Then her rage turned lethal. She started to choke the life out of him. He finally woke up to her calloused hands wrapped around his throat. He couldn't comprehend this. He staggered out of the room away from her. Then he realized he was bruised and beaten. He couldn't understand what had happened. He said, Kathy, what the hell? He couldn't see her in the darkness. He wasn't sure if it was his loving Kathy or the other side of her, rageful Kathy. She then kissed him and in a loving voice asked if he was ready to go again, backed away from her and said, you choked me. And she said, well, just a little. Then the rage came back into her and she told him, don't be a pansy. She said, you weren't waking up. He said, you can't just choke me, you crazy bitch. She said, you don't talk to your wife like that. You married me. That means you're mine. Get your ass back in that bedroom. David told her, you're nuts. You got a screw loose. Kathy said her daddy did it with Barbara five times on their wedding night. They needed to do it more. She recalled all of the stories Barbara would tell her. David backed away from her. He was horrified. He thought it was strange her talking like that about her parents. 
She told him not to worry, it was just a little fight, and most married couples fight sometimes. He finally agreed. He said he would meet her there shortly. He went into the bathroom and locked the door to lay in the bathtub to fall asleep. He was too drunk to be woken up by the bangs at the door. After this, things seemed to go back to normal. Kathy was back in her bliss with all the butchering she would do at work. She would wash his clothes, clean the house, and do everything that David felt made her a perfect wife. David just felt the night of their wedding was a one-off. He felt maybe he was too drunk to remember it correctly. He chose to only see her good side, the loving, beautiful wife. However, if he was a minute late from work, she would accuse him of infidelity. David ended up taking a job at the slaughterhouse again just so that she could keep an eye on him every day. He felt this would eliminate any doubts she had in her mind. However, this is not the case. Kathy's accusations were constant. The bad treatment started to weigh down on him. It was exhausting living like this. He felt he was always walking on eggshells with her. He wasn't a big tough guy like the other men he worked with. He had to work harder than them to keep up. He started going out after work with the guys to the bar. Kathy ended up cutting David some slack and she would go home and do the duty she felt made her a good wife to earn her affection from David. Kathy would try to spend one night at home cleaning and the other night going to the bar with him to pretend everything was fine. Kathy finally realized her father had his flaws, but he never cheated on her mother. She assumed this was because Barbara did everything she was supposed to be doing. Catherine then started to let David go out on his own. She would go home and make him home-cooked meal and wait on him hand and foot. She would still make accusations, but she felt that was okay. She felt that was the perfect balance. He would deal with her rambling because he would get the royal treatment. Kathy soon was pregnant, but this made her jealousy even worse. She did not want to be abandoned while pregnant. She seemed to always be on edge. One day he came home to change into a clean shirt before going to the bar and she wanted to know who the hell he was planning on meeting that night. She said, let's see how handsome he will be if he didn't have any clothes. She grabbed all of his clothes and threw them into the tub and lit them on fire. The fire department came and put the fire out. David showed up since a lot of the men that went to turn out the fire were with him at the bar. Now the whole town was aware of the dysfunctional relationship Kathy and David had. It was clear that the fire was intentional. After the fire, David wouldn't go to the bar for weeks. He was too embarrassed. They moved into a new apartment closer to the slaughterhouse. Kathy still was not happy. She would continue to accuse him of infidelity. He finally started going to the bar again. He came home and she started to yell at him. Obviously, burning his clothes wasn't enough. She swung a hot iron at him and burned his cheek. He was screaming in pain and went to the bathroom and locked the door. Her rage finally went away and she turned to crying and begging for forgiveness. She then bandaged him up. Poor David couldn't sleep that night, he was in so much pain. But he couldn't go to the hospital because he would have to admit how it happened. The next day at work, his supervisor took him to the hospital. Kathy didn't get in trouble since the ambulance wasn't called. After this, before going to work, David would break down his plans for the night in full detail. This way, Kathy wouldn't worry and wonder about him. One night, he was running slightly late. When it was only by one minute, she would start to get anxious. Now, if it was two minutes late, her rage would start to take over, she thought. She would slice him into pieces if he showed up now. She would make him pay. He came home four minutes late. All the lights were turned off and it was quiet. There was dinner on the table and she was asleep. David would be in the clear. He didn't want to have to deal with her. Maybe he would get to have a relaxing evening. He went into the kitchen and the next thing he knew, he was looking up at the stars in the sky. He felt severe pain in his head. He couldn't even scream. He felt like his head was crushed. He couldn't figure out what had happened. Every time he tried to move, the pain would get increasingly worse. Every time he tried to remember, the pain would just take over his mind. There was a sound like a gong. Wait, that was the sound of a frying pan hitting his head as hard as Kathy could swing at him. He touched the back of his head, felt his head had blood all over the back of it. He felt it took about an hour to crawl to the neighbor's house. The neighbors called an ambulance. He woke up in the hospital with Kathy holding his hand. Kathy sat there pregnant, looking harmless. Men were supposed to be tough and women were supposed to be subservient. Couldn't speak out and make himself look weak that his wife had beaten him. That would cost him his man card. The police showed up to take a report. Kathy said David was out drinking and she heard someone breaking into the house. It was a complete accident. The police bought this story. 
David wasn't sure if he could remember exactly what happened. He had no other choice but to go along with Kathy's story. A few days later, when David started to heal, they sent him home. Kathy helped him to bed and kissed him on the cheek. The perfect wife was back. She would tend to his every need. He felt his nightmare was over. Kathy was finally convinced to take leave from work due to her pregnancy. Kathy being home all day, David was reminded of Kathy's dark side. She would take drives during the day to pass the time and she would swerve to hit dogs and cats. This was the only thing that she could think of to do during the day that wouldn't take up too much energy. David wanted to go to a darts tournament at the bar. She asked him what time the tournament would be over. He told her 11 p.m. When 11 o'clock came along, she noticed David wasn't home. She called the bar to speak to him. He said he would be home in about an hour. He was in front of all his friends, so he said he would be home when he would be home. Of course, when he arrived, Kathy was waiting for him with her frying pan. David expected this. He was ready. He was able to bob away from her first few swings at him. He ran out of the house and caught up with one of his friends and stayed at their house that night. He went to work the next day. He was on edge thinking she would show up there. He knew he needed to leave her before she would kill him. David met a new lady and he felt he finally had somewhere to escape to. When he got home, Kathy was back to her normal self. He apologized and brought her flowers, but David was tiptoeing around her. He was now waiting for the perfect opportunity to leave her. On the day Kathy went into labor, her parents were called to drive her to the hospital. He was supposed to meet them at the hospital with their bags. Instead, he packed his own bag and marched over to the slaughterhouse to give his resignation. He drove out of town as fast as he could. He was finally free. Kathy had a long labor. She kept asking for David throughout the night. Kathy's sister went to look for him at the house. Kathy's sister asked his friends to look for him. Joy, Kathy's sister, thought there may be a work emergency. They told Joy he had quit. Kathy gave birth to their daughter, Melissa. She finally was able to feel the rage. She didn't have the normal bond with her daughter. She kept watching the door and waiting for David. He abandoned her. She would torture him. She was gonna get her knives and make sure she would use them on David. She would cut every tendon in his body so he couldn't get away again. Joy told Kathy the news of David's resignation. Kathy simply responded in a soft voice, thank you. Kathy and Melissa seemed sick. Kathy didn't even look at her daughter. She didn't have the normal bond with her new baby. They finally released Kathy and her daughter home. Kathy went through the motions of being a good mom, but then she started to tell Melissa all the stories of David just as her mother would share her stories, although Melissa couldn't respond. Kathy would not be pitied by the people in the town. She was too feared to any, for anyone to reach out to her. To Kathy, Melissa was just a reminder of David. Kathy started to resent Melissa. Melissa was only about three weeks old. Kathy would be seen yelling at her in public. The police were forced to approach Kathy. They felt she was lucky she hadn't gotten any attempted murder charges previously. They knew how to approach her carefully. Police officers were sent out to speak with her. When they arrived, they saw helpless Kathy in tears. She convinced them David abandoned her. They offered to take the baby to her parents and take her to the nearest hospital that worked with mental health cases. Kathy didn't know why she was taken to this hospital. The staff started to work with Kathy and figured out she was suffering from postnatal depression. They continued to do additional testing on her. The doctor felt her mental health problems stemmed from narcissism. She would come up with a pattern. She would deny things happened. She would admit to the accusations then throw blame at them. Or if that failed, she would say it was just retaliation from whatever they did to her. They diagnosed her with BPD, borderline personality disorder. They would put her through talk therapy and prescribe her drug therapy, and she was released seven days later. Her neighbors didn't hear a sound. They almost thought maybe she was healed. There was a man named Ted in the town who had become vagrant. He wasn't in the loop of the rumors and drama in town about Kathy. He would usually ignore things around him. He heard a baby wailing in the distance. He was walking around the train tracks, he kept trying to ignore the screams of the baby. He could feel the vibration of the train coming. Ted finally went to see where that baby was. He saw Melissa was laying on the tracks. He grabbed her just in time before the train came through. Kathy was in town in a rage. She was huffing and puffing around like a cave woman. She had an ax in her hand. She was swinging the ax around. People felt sorry for her. 
Kathy felt free of that weight of Melissa. She thought to herself, she would kill everyone in town who looked at her with pity. Ted came running with Melissa in his arms. Kathy dropped the ax in shock and the police were able to take her down. The hospital realized they needed a heavier dose of medication. They forcefully medicated her. She signed herself out of the hospital and her parents were called to pick her up. Ken took Kathy home alone. Ken and Barbara told Kathy they would care for Melissa until Kathy was well enough. A few days went by. Kathy went to her neighbor's house in tears. She said her baby was sick and she didn't have a car and needed to get to her. The neighbor grabbed her baby brother and got in the car. Kathy told her to drive to Queensland. The neighbor said, what's your baby doing there? Kathy said, who gives a shit about the baby? We're going to get David. His mom lives there. The neighbor, Maggie, saw that Kathy had a knife in her lap. Maggie said Queensland was about a thousand miles away and her little brother had school the next morning. Kathy pressed a knife on Maggie's face and drew a little blood. Maggie agreed to drive her. She said she needed to stop for gas. They stopped at the gas station and Maggie ran to tell the clerk her and her brother had been kidnapped by Kathy Knight. Maggie's little brother attempted to run away. Kathy had the knife to him as she held him by his hair. Kathy yelled to Maggie to drive the car or she would gut her brother like a hog. The clerk grabbed Maggie by the arm to stop her from returning to the car. The police finally arrived. Both of their hands were held up. They knew Kathy was crazy. They asked her to put the knife down. She started to yell and curse words at them. She told police she would slit the boy's throat if they got any closer. Kathy finally released the boy. Kathy was quick with her knives. She swung her knife at one of the police officers and he blocked with his hands. The other police officer rushed her. She had muscle memory with all the bar fights that she had under her belt. She hit the officer in his jaw and sliced his arm from wrist to elbow in an instant with her knife. She was grinning. The other officer tried to subdue her. She felt like this was a game. She was almost laughing at this point. The police had never had to deal with someone like her. She was so skilled with her knife. The gas station clerk threw broomsticks to the officers to help them take her down. They managed to knock the knife out of her hands and finally got her down and into the car. She was sent to the psychiatric hospital. She would stay there for about a month. In all of her sessions with the staff, she would discuss her plans of getting David. She would go into detail and explain how she planned to go to Queensland to his mother's house, and she would torture his mother until she gave Kathy David's new address. Then she would kill David's mom. She would finally find David and his new girlfriend and kill them too, and she would kill anyone who got in her way. She would then come home and kill anyone who helped David leave town, including the mechanic who fixed his car so he could leave. The police called David to let him know of Kathy's plan. David felt guilty for leaving her. He now left his pregnant girlfriend to relocate back to Aberdeen. He returned to his old job. He then signed Kathy out of the hospital into his care. He promised he would make sure she would take her medication and with the help of his mother, they would care for Kathy. She was released. They drove straight to Ken and Barbara's to pick up their daughter, Melissa. David knocked on the door and Barbara answered the door. She lunged at him and knocked him down. She was stomping on him. Kathy came running up and hit Barbara right in the chin. She yelled at Barbara and said, David saved me when you left me there. She left her mom on the ground and went into the house to get Melissa. They then went home. Kathy couldn't deal with all the stares from the people of the town. Kathy begged for David to take her out of town. They now moved to Woodridge. David's mom moved with them. Kathy felt her own presence was unnecessary. Her mother-in-law picked up all the housework and even watched after Melissa. Kathy got a job at the slaughterhouse now. She was back in her rhythm. She would stay on her medication. She didn't have pressure at home anymore since her mother-in-law was there to help. She was only happy at work when she was slicing through each animal. David and Kathy had a new daughter, Natasha, come into their lives. David took Kathy to all her appointments and he was by her side every step of the way for this pregnancy. But now, Kathy felt her mother-in-law was in the way. She wanted to bond with her baby this time, but David's mom was just in the way. Kathy felt bored. Even work or hitting animals with her car on the way home wouldn't bring her joy anymore. She started to resent David and ignore his mother and children. One day, she packed up the girls and drove back to Aberdeen. She just casually left him. David was upset but relieved at the same time. Kathy filed for divorce and her and her children got a house and she went back to work at the slaughterhouse. Felt like she never skipped a beat. 
One day she hurt her back at work. She went to the hospital. This injury would end her career. She was put on disability and workman's compensation. Kathy was now 31 years old. Melissa was Kathy's friend now. She would warn Melissa about men, but she would say she was lonely. Kathy started going to bars and leave Melissa to watch after her sister. Kathy's reputation followed her. There were a few men that would come from neighboring towns to drink at the bar. There was one man named David Saunders, David S, we will call him. He worked in the mines. He was socially awkward, so he wasn't aware of Kathy's stories. David S thought he hit the jackpot when he saw Kathy. She took him home and started to make him home cook meals every night. He basically moved in with her. When his co-workers found out whom he was dating, they tried to warn him. He thought they were just jealous. He didn't think his beloved Kathy would be capable of any of their stories. However, they would argue frequently. Kathy was always suspicious of him. His work shifts were a little different. She would accuse him of being unfaithful, but he would think it was just a woman being jealous. David S. bought a dog for the girls a few days before, and Kathy referred to the dog as David's dog. He came home with some flowers on their one-year anniversary, but Kathy was in a mood. David couldn't figure out what was wrong. Kathy rushed out the back door, and David followed her. He heard a squeal. When he walked out, he saw Kathy dangling the dog by his fur and holding him up. She got a chopping knife and slit the dog's throat and dropped the dog to the ground. She told David, if I ever catch you sneaking around on me, this is what I will do to you. He walked away horrified, of course. Kathy followed him inside. David told her he would never be unfaithful to her. She swung a frying pan at him and started to hit him repeatedly. David was on the ground, and when she was tired, she stopped. When he finally woke up, he stayed away from her house for a week. He now caught himself flinching after every loud noise at work. One day after work, Kathy caught up to him. She was crying at his feet and begging him to come back. David felt that everyone deserved a second chance. A couple months went by, then Kathy was pregnant. He put down a deposit on a new house for them. Kathy was excited to decorate their new home with her prized possessions of taxidermy and knives. Their daughter Sarah was born. Kathy fell into depression, almost as if it reminded her of having Melissa. Kathy got a lump sum of money from Workman's Comp. She essentially bought out the house from under David. She paid it off in full. David would start to yell at Kathy about things around the house. He came home one day to a pile of dirty clothes. She hadn't done any laundry for about a week. She came into the room with one of his shirts in her hand and scissors in the other. She started to cut up his clothes. Then suddenly, he realized the scissors were in his stomach. He looked at Kathy and she had a dark look in her eyes. She twisted the scissors and pulled them out. She dropped them on the ground and was reaching for her iron. David would rush to his car. The stab wound wasn't fatal. He went to file for a leave absence from work. He left town for a few months and then returned to Aberdeen to get his daughter. He didn't get deep into town before he was pulled over by police. Kathy had filed an apprehended violence order against him, saying he was abusive to her. The police gave him two choices, either leave town or go to jail. He chose to leave town. John Chillingworth came back into Kathy's life. He was back in Aberdeen. He went to the bar. Kathy was there. He was 10 years older than her. John was recently divorced. He only knew how to work and drink. Kathy invited John to go home with her. He was a perfect fit for Kathy. He wouldn't need to have complex conversations. He would work, they would drink, and he would meet her sexual needs. John was different from the other men. He had a survival instinct. When Kathy first accused him of being unfaithful, he would look at her almost amused. He was a tough man. When Kathy swung at him, he would dodge out of the way and counter it with a slap. She threw him out of the house. She wasn't used to having a victim fight back. The next morning, there was Kathy sweet talking him back in. John was used to the arguments at home now. Melissa was now 15 years old. She was treated as an equal by Kathy. Kathy was pregnant again. John was living with her. He didn't see the point of getting married and Kathy wasn't asking for it. John would leave the house when Kathy would accuse him of being unfaithful. John started to do the things Kathy would accuse him of. Catherine gave birth to her only son, Eric. John was welcomed back into the home. Now Kathy was maternal. He loved the soft side of her. He felt he needed to make things right with Kathy now. He confessed to her. She walked calmly to the bathroom. She punched the glass where John's dentures were shattering the glass and his teeth inside it. 
Now she swung at his mouth to break the ones he had in his mouth, too. He glared at her. He wasn't going to cower down to her. The next morning, he went to gather his belongings. Kathy was on the ground nearly dead from an overdose. He took her to the hospital. John stayed with her children while she stayed in the hospital. He was apologetic when she returned home. It seemed life was back to normal. One day, John came home to find Kathy in bed with another man. He knew this was deliberate. She knew his schedule to a T. She wanted him to see this. He was done. He left, he moved, he got clean and got a job as a counselor. He was able to escape Catherine. John Price, we'll call him Pricey, was the man that was in bed with Kathy that night. He had divorced his wife and had custody of two of his children. He was one of the first responders in the mine. He seemed to bring out the best in Kathy. Kathy's children liked Pricey. He was a gentleman, yet strong. Of course, in no time, she would accuse Pricey of infidelity. She didn't immediately resort to violence. She would assault him, but he took it as flattering jealousy. Pricey would hear Kathy's side of the story of the rumors he would hear about her. Kathy wanted to know if he was so devoted, why wouldn't they get married? He felt marriage was unnecessary. They could live happily together without getting married. Eventually, to get her off his back, he invited her and her children to live with him. Each of the kids could have their own bed. She kept her house. For almost a year, they lived in their honeymoon period. Kathy became maternal to Pricey's kids. She kept on asking him about marriage. One day, Pricey brought home old first aid kits that were thrown out at work. Kathy recorded all of this on a video camera and sent the tape to his boss. Within a week, Pricey's work fired him. He drove home and got Kathy's things and threw them out into the road. The police were called and Kathy was forced to gather her things and return to her house. Pricey felt a weight was lifted. He was free of her. He finally got a job at the slaughterhouse, so he crossed paths with Kathy. Every night, Kathy was in the bar. She turned to the bottle like her father. Pricey started to remember the good times with Kathy. He approached her one day, and their relationship resumed. Pricey let Kathy back into his bed, but not move back into his house. He wasn't ready for her to move back in. Pricey's friends gave him an ultimatum. If he was going to be with her, they would no longer be friends with him. They couldn't believe he went back to her. Pricey's friends reached out to Kathy's first husband, David. David was called to come to town to warn Pricey. He would show him his scars. He said, if you cross her, she will kill you. Pricey wasn't buying the stories, so David left town again. Kathy would be allowed at Pricey's house for date night or to cook for him. Kathy wanted to move back into the house permanently. She would start arguments and they would turn violent. Kathy would beg for forgiveness. They were just mistakes. Pricey said she wasn't going to move back in. Kathy would fill with rage, then they would kiss and make up. One night during an argument, Pricey felt something warm and wet on his chest. He looked down to see a knife sticking out of his chest. It wasn't deep enough to kill him. He grabbed Kathy and threw her out the front door. He pulled a knife out of his chest. If it would have gone a little deeper, it would have killed him. He rushed to lock the back door. He went to check all the windows. He knew this relationship couldn't continue. She would end up killing him. He went to get a restraining order against Kathy. Then he went to work. Everyone noticed the blood seeping through his shirt. They all knew what had happened. He told them, if I don't come into work tomorrow, it's because she killed me. He didn't even want to go home after work. He went to the bar instead. They all offered him a place to stay for the night. He turned them down. He said if he didn't go home, then he feared she would kill the kids. When he got home, the kids weren't there. Kathy had sent them to stay the night at a friend's house. There was a note from the kids. He was happy he knew they were safe. He eventually fell asleep in his bed. Kathy stalked Pricey all that day. All she knew is she would make him pay. She took the video camera with her, went to Pricey's house, and recorded the kids. On the video, she was saying what belongings the kids would get if something happened to Pricey and herself. Then she drove into town and bought some lingerie. She then went home until the sun went down. She then let herself into Pricey's house. She felt this was her home, and Pricey would be waiting for her in bed. She showered and put the lingerie on. Pricey was lying on his back. She started to undress him. This was her man. She started to make love to him. He finally woke up. She felt he was giving in to her. She now had him where she wanted him. Her knives were hanging above the bed. He pushed her aside. How dare him reject her? She got a knife in her hand out of nowhere, lunging at him. It slipped into him. He couldn't understand his lung was collapsing. She pulled it out and then sliced into his liver. 
He tried to get away and she stabbed him in his back. Kathy was smiling. She was excited to see the blood everywhere. Pricey ran for the front door. He didn't have the strength. He fell down and she hammered the knife into him. Rage was the only thing that ever made sense to her. She continued to stab him over and over. Pricey reached for the door handle, opened the door. He tried to scream, but he couldn't. Kathy dragged him back in. He no longer had any strength left. After stabbing him about 25 times, Kathy finally had her revenge. She now realized he was dead. She was a murderer. She needed to figure out how to get out of this, but she needed to shower first. She then drove into town. She went to an ATM with Pricey's card to take out all of the money in his account. She was trying to decide what her next move would be. If she left town, then everyone would know she killed him. She didn't want to be seen as the bad guy. She thought she would go back to the house and make a plan. Pricey did this. He's the one that ruined everything. If he would have loved her the way he should have, this wouldn't have happened. She grabbed her knives. She made these cuts a million times before. She would cut him like a pig, severed his head and threw it into the pot on the stove. She threw in vegetables and water. She thought she would serve this to his children. But that wouldn't be enough food. She went back to the rest of his body. The kitchen started to smell just like the stew her mom used to make. She didn't know what to do with the skin, so she hung it from the ceiling. She thought the rump of the swine would be a good amount of meat. She set the table and started to write the names of his children to label their plates. She threw the rest of the corpse into his favorite chair. She thought she would maybe dress up the body, but nothing would cover up that his head was missing. She wrote a note to say that he was a pedophile and molested his own children and hers. She thought this was a perfect lie. She would be the hero in this story. The meal was ready. She served the meat and poured vegetables on top and then the gravy. She would taste it to see if it tasted as good as it smelled. She couldn't swallow it. She threw the rest outside. The kids couldn't eat this. They wouldn't be convinced it was a pig. This wasn't a good plan after all. She searched for her pills and started to take all the sleeping pills she could find. Then she laid in the blood-soaked bed. She could now rest. When Pricey didn't show up for work, a co-worker went to his house to check on him. The police were immediately called. They found Kathy. She wasn't dead. The police couldn't figure out what was hanging from the ceiling. The police had never seen anything of this magnitude. Some police even committed suicide after this case. Others never ate meat again after their findings. They knew whoever killed him was an expert skinner. Two days later, Kathy woke up. Kathy claimed to not remember anything from that night. All the people of the town begged the police to not let her go. This went to trial. Kathy admitted to manslaughter to get a lesser sentence. The judge wasn't having it. Then Kathy switched her plea to not guilty. Kathy was sent for more assessments to prove she could not use an insanity plea. She was then diagnosed formally with BPD. With this, she said she suffered with disassociation. Kathy was found guilty with premeditated murder. She was given life in prison without a chance for parole. Everyone is terrified of her. She's not even allowed a cellmate. She's too dangerous to have a cellmate. Kathy's twin Joy is the only family member who visits Kathy. Kathy still shows no signs of remorse. Without remorse, parole will never be considered. Kathy feels remorse will show weakness. This was a horrible crime, one of the worst crimes in Australian history. I can't believe she was going to feed him to his own children. Thank you all for listening today. If you haven't yet, please subscribe to my channel and I'll see you guys next time.